Recording. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to our monthly webinar series from SAWS Conservation. Uh, I'm Nathan Riggs, Program Coordinator here at, in the department and uh, entomologist by education. Uh, so I've known a few things about bugs over the years. Uh, you'll notice that uh, Gail Gallegos was supposed to be my co-pilot today, but she is not feeling well. And so uh, I will introduce all of y'all to Sasha Codet. She is my co-pilot for today. So uh, Sasha, how are you? Great, thank you so much for including me today, Nathan. This oh, heck is yeah. one of my favorite topics. I love bugs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and there is a such thing as a love bug, by the way. Yes. yes. <clears throat> so, um, Sachi, you want to go over the pleasantries? Absolutely. So just a couple housekeeping items here. Um, Nathan has a wonderful presentation for you. And if you all have any questions, I'd like to ask you to please put them in the Q&A box. So on the bottom of your screen, you may have um, a little button with three dots and you can find the uh, Q&A in there. Um, not in the chat button. So please use that Q&A section for any questions. And this is also a rewards eligible program. Um, so we do have a code word a little bit later <laughs> that y'all will want to write down and enter in the survey at the end of the presentation. So yes, love to have your questions. Go ahead and throw them in the Q&A box for us. Thank you. Yep, and we will answer them as we go along. Um, this isn't a long talk today um, by content standards, but we'll have a lot of conversation. So if you have questions, please, uh, please throw them in. We'll be glad to visit and and um, and talk about them. So uh, let's get started. Uh, this is this is a time of the year when there's a lot of things going on, and so um, what we want to do is uh, talk a little bit about migrating butterflies uh, that's always a topic for the fall in san antonio uh some other common uh, insects and, and spiders especially that we see this time of the year that sort of have their own story and uh what you can do to provide food for these migrating butterflies especially and that's very important when we're we're talking about butterflies especially monarchs that have traveled quite a ways to get here uh, and their travel is not finished. So let's let's just jump right in. Um, now, for many of us, we're all familiar with the story of Charlotte's Web and the big spider that spun webs in the barn for uh, her friend and she could write letters in her web. Well, there are a lot of uh, a lot of people around here who have these big black and yellow argiope spiders, orb weavers as they're commonly called, at their homes on the outside, maybe at their, if they have a place out in the country, they see these big spiders. And I know a lot of people who have named them Charlotte. Uh, I don't know about you, Sasha, but uh, I see these a lot out at our ranch house south of San Antonio. And this is the time of the year when these spiders are at their largest size. They are as old as they're going to get. They live for the season. They hatch in the spring and they, they die when temperatures get cold in the fall. They leave behind eggs that will hatch next spring and, uh, and give us a new generation. Uh, do you, I know you like to walk a lot, Sasha. Do you see these spiders when you're out on your walks? Yes, and actually I've been really lucky. I have one that has taken up a residence over um, by our fence, um, kind of on the edge of the fence and the deck. And so it's been kind of fun to to watch it hang out there. Um, sometimes they kind of like tuck their pairs of legs together so they look almost like an X, right? Yeah, and, oh, totally. Yeah. And uh, that is so cool. And, it, and a lot of times uh, as the season sort of progresses and in midsummer, you'll see these these spiders, and the females are the ones that get really big, like the one in the picture I'm showing now. It's a female, but usually in early to midsummer, they get boyfriends. And so you'll see in the in the upper left picture there, this particular female has two male suitors, 
and the little the males are always tiny and much much smaller um, and their coloration is very similar but they're a very popular spider they're kind of scary for some people because they 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 can be as big as the palm of your hand uh, you know when they're full size and a lot of people call them orb weavers some people call them corn spiders and there is a, a term banana spider that's bantied around a lot but that is not a correct common name because there's another spider uh, in the United States that is more accurately with this term and um, uh, let's see if let's see if anybody has seen one of these this is the yellow or the golden orb spider the golden orb spider is found in far far southeast Texas in the swampy places and all the way around to Florida and these spiders get their name because their silk for their webs is is kind of a golden color and they can be as big as your hand uh, on a web and they are terrifying I've never seen one uh, in person but uh, they're huge and they call them banana spiders have you seen one of these Sasha in in your travels no, I don't think I've come across one of those yet. That would definitely be an exciting moment. <laughs> yeah, they're so big. Uh, I've, I've seen plenty of pictures. Uh, and I, yeah, I don't think I'd want to walk under one of these. And um, and I'm an entomologist and sometimes spiders, you know, give me the heebie-jeebies, but uh, most of the <laughs> time it's, can... no. Yeah. I was going to say, and sometime on sometimes on these um, spider webs we see kind of like a white zigzag yes yeah um, the white zigzag is actually used by the spider to break up their outline uh, it, and because otherwise there's a spider in the middle of the web it's more it's easier to see them if you're a an insect flying by uh, and you might avoid the web but the zigzag the white zigzag silk helps to break up their outline and makes it easier for them to catch food, uh, which is kind of interesting. And not all spiders do it, but the orb weavers definitely do. Uh, and so we we see them a lot when, they, when uh, they're on their webs, they have that neat little zigzag. Okay, now there's another one uh, that we see a lot in the fall uh, because they begin to aggregate. These are Asian multicolored lady beetles or ladybugs. It's a it's one particular species, and they get their name because they are not just a red ladybug. Uh, they can be anywhere from pale yellow all the way to black, and uh, most of them are orange or red, as you can see in this this sort of. Uh, conglomeration of pictures and you can see that they also may or may not have spots or or um, may just have one or two and and that's where they get their name but their most easy way to recognize them is if you look at the top of their little heads they have a pattern that looks like an M upside down M or a W I guess if you look at it from one perspective or the other and the thing that really gets these particular insects crossways with humans because they like to hibernate indoors in the winter time and so when temperatures start to get cool or cold they start to go into the walls of buildings sometimes they'll they'll end up in the corners of buildings and they stay there uh, during the winter and and the what happens is uh, like on a january or february day when it's warm, like if it gets up into the 60s, they wake up and all of a sudden there's ladybugs all over the house on the inside. And when I work, used then to work for do. the, <laughs> yeah, then what do you do, right? Uh, when I worked for the extension office here in San Antonio, we got these calls all the time. What do I do? My house is full of ladybugs. We always told people, if you have a handheld vacuum or something like that, or a shop vac even, suck them up and then let them go outside uh, and then make sure all your cracks and crevices in your house are sealed uh, to discourage them from getting back in uh, because sometimes when you upset them they will release this yellow liquid 
it smells bad, it's a defense mechanism, but it also will stain. And so you get yellow marks on your walls and things like that. Um, have you ever seen something like this, Sacha? Have you ever come across a, finding a bunch of these ladybugs like this? Yeah, we get them occasionally um, in our windowsills and then, yeah, I don't like to hurt them. So I do kind of gather them up and take them outside and release them. Yep. Um, because like you said, they are beneficial in the garden. And we have a question from someone asking if All you right. talk a little bit more about how they are beneficial for our backyard gardens. That's a great question. Uh, the funny thing is many of the ladybug species we see in our backyards have come from other places, have come from other countries as part of biological control programs in agriculture. Uh, one of the first biological control programs involved bringing uh, ladybugs from Australia to the United States to control cottony cushion scales. And so those, those first species of ladybugs then took hold and uh, helped to control those populations naturally. So many of the ladybug species you see are beneficial because they eat all kinds of insects. They eat aphids and their eggs uh, that you you can you get aphids a lot on hibiscus on milkweed, um, gosh, uh, trees. I mean, aphid aphids are a sap sucking, very tiny sap sucking insect. Ladybugs love them. Um, you they also feed, some of them feed on mites uh, that that get on your plants. Others eat small caterpillars uh, before they get very large. So they're the ladybugs in general are very beneficial, and uh, and so it's uh, important to to maintain uh, places for them to hide. They love to hide in vegetation, and you can even purchase ladybugs online in nurseries and release them in your garden. And we even have a video on the Saws uh, YouTube page where we did a, a ladybug release. I think that video is probably three or four years old, um, but we have one about that. Uh, and, and species, you would want to do that more in the evening, right, Nathan? Do you have some right. tips for if you're going to release those ladybugs? Yes. Uh, if you want to release ladybugs, you want to do it in the evening when uh, the sun's going down, temperatures are cooling off so that they stay in the area for a longer period of time. If you release ladybugs during the day, they're going to fly away and they're not going to stay in your, your landscape. So it's good to release them at night. And I, um, I, we even talk about that. And the ladybugs that you usually get in those, they're called convergent ladybugs. And these are another species that hibernate in humongous numbers up in the mountains and out west. So, uh, and we have tons of convergent ladybugs in San Antonio as well. So, uh, and really neat. And they're pretty thirsty when you let them out of the little bag that they're in too, right? So you might want to spray the plants or. That's right. Spray with the hose a little bit so they can get something to drink too. That's right. That and that's a recommendation when you when you purchase ladybugs uh, because they do come with a, sort of a little sponge in the bag, uh, but it's usually dry by the time you get it. So you do want to mist your plants and give them something to drink uh, because they're going to need a little bit of hydration so they can go out and slaughter those mean pesky bugs that are eating on your plants. So it's a great thing. It's a great thing for for adults and kids to watch ladybugs just in their plants because they're so colorful and 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 they're good luck. It's supposed to be good luck if the ladybug lands on you. So there you go. I I think the larvae look pretty cool too, right? Don't they say they're they're kind of like black and um, orange, but don't they say they look like little alligators? And yes. They're very voracious. So they're they, gonna be yes. you know, even in the larval stage um, feeding on insects in your garden. That's right. And and some even say that maybe the larval stage eats more eats more than the adult stage, uh, but yeah, they do look like uh, alligators. So if you go look up uh, ladybug larva, uh, Google it, and yeah, they they're pretty uh they're pretty mean looking, but just as beneficial as their parents. Okay, so let's talk about heading south for the winter uh, for a bit here, and let's talk about migrating monarch butterflies. Now, uh, generally speaking, the time of the year when monarchs seem to come through at the peak is sometime between 
October 10th and 22nd on average uh, for San Antonio. And by the time butterflies get to San Antonio, many of them have been traveling for quite a while. Uh, as you can see from our map here, a lot of the butterflies that make it to Mexico are coming from places like upper Midwest. Some of them even come from as far as New Jersey or New York, depending on the, the, the flight path that they take. And they still have a ways to go after San Antonio. They spend the winter in the mountains of the Michoacan province in, in Mexico. And it's, it's not a very large area. It's just a, a few acres. It's like 30 or 40 acres. And there's bazillions, and, and yes, that is a real term, bazillions of butterflies. As you can see from this one photo here, they just cover the trees. And people uh, can take tours and go up uh, uh, in the wintertime to see these, to see these areas. And um, it is a, it's a source of income for the tourist industry in that part of Mexico. And it, it's interesting, the numbers fluctuate from year to year. Some years they're up and some years they're, they're down. The amount of acreage where the butterflies live in Mexico is sort of an indicator is how many are gonna come back and how many go through. Um, the migration is just sort of starting now. Um, the other, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, doing some shredding out at the, our ranch place south of town and there was maybe 50 uh, that I saw at that particular time, but we have a ton of um, little yellow uh, composite flowers that are blooming, and so they were they were feeding on those on the way through. Uh, but what's the interesting thing about monarchs in our area is that the monarchs that make it all the way to Mexico, they when they uh, come back, they come back and lay their eggs in the spring to start the next generation. And that next generation then produces the eggs that will migrate back to Mexico. And so these monarchs that come from Mexico don't live for a whole nother year to go back. They, they just migrate, they come back and lay their eggs. And so it's important that uh, we give them what they need uh, for, for food and for shelter, they do like to rest along the way, and they do that in, usually in trees a lot. So let's take another, let's take a little bit more of a look here. And this is sort of in our, our, uh, our wheelhouse, if you will, uh, our landscape coupon program. Uh, if you take advantage of it to remove grass and and get uh, zero scape plants, you can use a a a landscape coupon to purchase some of these flowers that you could make a garden to attract and, and fuel up monarchs and other species of butterflies uh, in the fall and, and in the rest of the year. Uh, what are your favorite butterfly plants, Sasha? Oh gosh, um, I think I love a lot of the different asters. I think they enjoy those. Um, mist flower is another one that I, like to promote as you have there, especially mm -hmm. the queens love it. It's really yes. fascinating um, because I think that they get a chemical from that flower um, that the males use to attract the females. So very, really? very neat. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so those, are, those are a couple of my favorites there. Um, but yeah, Blackfoot Daisy, um, mm. there are a lot of different options. And I would definitely recommend that y'all go to our gardenstyleessay.com website. And we have that find a plant section where you can um, use that to search for pollinator friendly plants, um, plants that are great for wildlife and find some good options. For sure. There's so much content on our, on our find a plant section that it is mind boggling. All the the pictures that our staff has been able to accumulate either from ourselves or from from uh, photographers and you there are just so many different plants and it's and it, they're just some really beautiful examples of things that you can have in your landscape that will attract a variety of of butterflies and even hummingbirds uh, some mm -hmm. butterflies and hummingbirds do like some of the same plants which is pretty neat um and Richard, yes, there will be a recording. I saw that little note flash up on the screen. We are recording right now. So you haven't missed a thing. Uh, 
we will we will definitely have this available uh, at a later date uh, to view as many times as you'd like to. So, and like you said, Nathan, you. you do want to select plants that are going to bloom in the spring, going to be blooming in the summer, going to be blooming in the fall, um, so that they're supported all year round. And did you talk a little bit about uh, larval host plants? Um, I, I didn't, but larval host plants are just as important, and especially for monarchs. Uh, milkweed is is the preferred host plant for monarch butterflies, and there's a couple of different ways to go. Many, many people plant the tropical milkweed uh, in their landscapes. It's the one with the little orange and yellow flowers, and monarchs love them, and they they tend to rebound pretty well after being uh, fed upon pretty heavily by the caterpillars. I think at one, my mom has some at her place, and at one point she had, I think she had 45 monarch chrysalises hanging off of the uh, eaves of her house that looked like little green Christmas lights. Um, mm. And um, and of course, they're all empty now. Uh, I think she only had two that did not emerge. Uh, so really, really neat uh, to see that. And uh, and then a lot of people also like the native milkweeds, like the green milkweed, antelope horns milkweed. And those milkweeds um, are typically found a lot in bar ditches. You see them blooming in the summer in bar ditches along the sides of the road. And they provide a good food source and a good, a good food source for the larvae as well as for the adults. Uh, one thing I want to mention about tropical milkweed in San Antonio. If we we do have monarch butterflies that will stay here for the winter, will not migrate and just live around here. And so if they have if you happen to have tropical milkweed at your home that it still has lots of leaves, it's still healthy, and uh, the the butterflies lay their eggs on it, caterpillars feed on the leaves, there is a protozoan parasite uh, that is it's called OE. And if the caterpillars happen to eat a milkweed with that par protozoan parasite, it will affect their growth, potentially keeping them from making it to the adult stage. And if they do make a chrysalis, then the chrysalis may not form properly and the adult may not form properly. So one recommendation, if you have tropical milkweed over the winter is to cut it down. Uh, once we get our first frost, cut it down. And that way, uh, those butterflies will not, that takes away the potential for them to be infected by this OE parasite. And, um, and then in the spring, everything will grow back. And typically the, the danger of this protozoan parasite uh, passes once springtime rolls around, but it can be a problem in the winter. So uh, that's the one thing about tropical milkweed to keep in mind. How are we doing on questions? Do we have any more? Um, yeah, and actually we do have um, one quick question here, but before I get to that, I just want to let folks know if, you know, you are looking for these native plants to um, plant in your garden, um, there are lots of great sources out there. Um, and what I would recommend is um, you go to the Native Plants of Texas uh, website and they keep a list of um, like local nurseries and garden centers where you can find some of these plants um, or be a good resource for you if you, um, you know, want to order something online uh, to get some of these native plants to support butterflies. Um, so again, that's the Native Plant Society of Texas. And I'll drop a, a link to that in the chat in just a moment. Um, so, uh, but also think about too, like, um, a lot of our local gardening clubs or the botanical garden will have plant sales too, so they can be another good resource for you. Absolutely. Um, good call, Sasha. Uh, there's a lot of native plant files uh, in San Antonio, and um, we've got a couple, three or four in our department uh, as well. So, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's really important to provide a good environment for them. And I see that question in the chat yes. uh, or in Q&A. Bug spray. So using bug spray to get rid of spiders and bugs is actually harming my garden. Um, well, 
there's you got to kind of think of it like this most of the sprays that you purchase to control pest insects are no, are non specific uh, they they will affect anything that they touch pretty much so if you have a pest problem for instance in your garden and you you spray everything with it you will affect the pests and you could potentially affect the good guys too so one of the one of the recommendations if you have a pest problem in your garden is to consider using um, IPM principles, integrated pest management principles, which means that you use a variety of approaches to deal with the pest problem. Uh, number one, uh, is your pest problem enough that you have to do something about it? Uh, that's one thing to consider. Are they damaging your plants to the point where your plants are suffering or your plants are not uh, of an aesthetic that you prefer? The next thing is, if they are causing a problem, do you go after them maybe with a biological approach like aphids, getting some ladybugs uh, for your aphids problems, things like that. And if you do have to use some sort of a, a spray, use it in a targeted manner. Just treat the areas where the pests are instead of treating it in an umbrella fashion. Uh, this tends to, this tends to reduce some of that potential exposure for the good guys. Um, honeybees are impacted a lot in this way as are butterflies. So you want to have a very target specific type of application if you really need to spray. Um, and, and, and that's kind of what we, what we would recommend uh, for dealing with the problem. So that's a great question. Uh, and it's just something where you have to be careful uh, when you're when you're doing your treatments, that's the, the easiest way I can say it. Now, Sasha, did you know that San Antonio is the only monarch city in the United States? Really? Tell yes. me more, Nathan. I know we have a special event that's going to be coming up soon to celebrate. Um, our monarch city status and the butterfly migration that's going on. Yes, and so uh, the a few years ago, uh, maybe five, it's probably been five or six years ago now, the city of San Antonio put in an application uh, with, I'm sorry, I can't remember the organization, to apply to be a monarch city. In order to do that, you have to, you have to meet like 20 criteria. You have to, you have to plant uh, gardens that will help feed monarchs along the way, adults. Uh, you have to do education programs, and there are a lot of many criteria, and, and we met those and became an official monarch city. Uh, I think it was back in 2015, 2016. And so we have this uh, monarch festival every fall this year. It's at Confluence Park. October 16th, which is uh, a week away. It's not this weekend, but it's the weekend after. And it'll be from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And there'll be lots of booths and uh, information and fun things there. Lots of activities for the kids. And so it's definitely worth uh, getting out there if, uh, if you'd like to see that. And we have, uh, we are very fortunate to have um, the the people that run the Texas Butterfly Ranch website here in town. And um, the Texas Butterfly Ranch has a lot of very interesting articles and links about what happens with the butterfly migration. They actually have tagging parties where they go catch monarch butterflies. They put tiny little round paper tags uh, on their wings and help track them through the migration. I think, um, in 2020 or 2019, they actually found a couple of the butterfly ranches tags in Mexico on butterflies. So if you ever see a monarch butterfly with a little white circle on its wing, it has been tagged and is being tracked uh, along its progress. And the first uh, link there, Monarch Butterfly Migration Through San Antonio, that's on the SAWS YouTube channel. And this was a, 
a Facebook Live that we did from the Botanical Gardens, uh, Lily, Liliana Gonzalez and myself, uh, when it was in the peak of monarch migration. And so it's a little pixely uh, because, I mean, it was five years ago and video has video recording has changed so much, but you can see all the plants uh, there at the Botanical Gardens and the the plethora of butterflies uh, that were there. And it was a really, really fun thing to do. So that's, that'll be a link that you can check out and uh, in addition to the Texas Butterfly Ranch um, link as well. And, and again, if you're interested in the, the Butterfly and Pollinator Festival, please take advantage of that. It is a neat thing and it's, it's a special thing for San Antonio. All right, we have any other questions so far? Because we were sort of getting down to uh, close to potentially maybe seeing a, a special keyword or something, I think. Yeah, let's we'll see. see. Um, actually, and I was gonna mention to folks too that um, there are a lot of pollinator activities going on. I know Texas Parks and Wildlife is um, doing a uh, Texas pollinator bio blitz. And so they're asking folks to go out and take pictures of pollinators and then post them to Instagram with the uh, hashtag TX pollinators. And, um, or also they have a Facebook event page you can check out or to post pictures to iNaturalist, which is an app that you can download on your phone and take a picture and you upload it. You can get help identifying what um, kind of bug it is or what kind of plant. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a great citizen science effort that's going on out there too. Um, yeah, that iNatural app is really cool. I have it and uh, I actually, I've actually used it for plants a couple of times. Uh, so it's really, really neat deal. And you know, a lot of people, when they think about pollinators, they think, okay, bees uh, and butterflies. And typically, you, you, that, that covers the vast majority, but uh, there are other pollinators uh, that, that work. Uh, there are beetles, ants, tiny wasps, uh, big wasps, and flies that actually do some pollinating as well. But uh, their, their efforts are minor compared to what honeybees and, and even more importantly, the honeybees, the native bees, like the mason bees and the leafcutter bees and, and orchard bees that pollinate, and even the bumbles, the bumblebees as well. So pollinators are important. A lot of our food comes from pollination. So we wanna keep them around. And, and that's, that's a very important thing. So, um, and Nathan, I may have missed it earlier. Um, yes. But did you discuss, I know you have a recipe um, that involves orange oil um, for pests in the garden. Uh, yeah, well, we have a, re we have an orange oil recipe to deal with fire ants. Okay. And of course, yes, fire ants can be in the garden uh, anywhere where you are are watering and and keeping the soil moist in an otherwise dry environment is going to attract fire ants. Uh, fire ants need moisture. They are tropical in nature. They come from South America originally. And so the recipe that that we have, and I think that we've got a YouTube uh, video for for that one too, is, uh, you take a gallon of um, you take a, a gallon of water to it. You add three tablespoons of dish soap, Blue Dawn dish soap. That is not a plug for Blue Dawn. It's just the one that worked in our test trials. And then you want uh, one and a half to three ounces of orange oil. And you don't want essential oil. You want to use the cold pressed orange oil that you can buy. For instance, Medina has an orange oil product. That's the one I just remember off the top of my head. Um, but it, you want cold pressed orange oil um, that the soap and water, you mix it up um, together. You put Do the water first, add the orange oil and the soap to that, shake it up. And then you drench the, the fire ant hill with that. And it works very, very well. Uh, it'll give you about a 70% control rate 
the first time and it will make your plants or grass that uh that become come in contact with that solution it will turn them yellow because it does burn the orange oil does burn so uh, but it usually doesn't kill plants it just burns them but that's a really nice thing for at least fire ants in the garden uh, so uh, check that out you can go to the saws youtube channel and look up orange oil or fire ants and it will that video will pop up and you will see a familiar face uh, doing that particular video. So I'll, I'll let you figure out. So Nathan, I see another question on here. Yes. Where, um, someone has seen that um, there was someone looking for people to volunteer to put uh, beehives on their property and then they would collect the honey. Um, and they're asking, um, do I need to have a lot of flowers in order to support a beehive? Oh, that's a great question. Um, bees do need flowers uh, for to create that honey, but they can do that in a lot of different ways. Uh, flowering trees uh, will will allow them to collect honey or collect nectar to make honey. Uh, in addition to all of the various flowering plants that that are around, but bees travel far and wide to find a source of sugar water uh, for their for their colony. And for instance, when we're in drought and there's not a lot of flowers around, you know where bees like to go? They like to go to the garbage can at McDonald's or <laughs> to the gas station where there is old sodas and stuff like that in the trash uh, because that's a source of sugar water. So um, having flowers on your property is great but if they if you don't have them there they'll still find they'll still find that food and um something that has come up in the past few years is that you can you can use beehives on your property for an agricultural tax exemption so uh, for instance if you have five acres i think you have to have five acres but if you have five acres of land and you're paying regular property taxes on that, I believe you can get, I don't know what the, the number of hives you need in Bear County, uh, but you can put bees on it and get a tax, agricultural tax exemption um, for that. Even if you're not collecting the honey if someone else is, you still get a tax exemption for that. So um, really neat deal. And and I believe it's, it's every five acres. So if you have a large piece of land, uh, Every, you can put hives for every five acres. Um, and so something to research, you can go to the Bear County Appraisal District website and look up the information on beehives as an ag tax exemption. So great call and, and definitely something if you're interested, uh, that they're fun, bees are, st are very industrious and very fun to watch, that's for sure. So. <laughs> I think that AgriLife Extension has programs on how to do beekeeping, like you said, too. So that's another great thing. They absolutely do. And um, they also, uh, you know, they're sort of the other side of bees as well. If you have a, a beehive that has shown up at your place that you would like to potentially have collected and moved, you can call AgriLife Extension. They have lists of beekeepers who can come get them. Some do it for free, some do it for a price, uh, but they will come collect the bees. Um, and potentially take them if they're just regular honeybees, they'll potentially take and use them. If they are potentially African hybrid or African strain bees that are a little, uh, a little more on the not friendly side, they may, they may choose to do other things with them uh, if they have to. So, but definitely want to check all of these options out. And uh, in the spirit of our presentation, our code word today is migration. So uh, you could use that word on your uh, quiz uh, to help get your one point. And um, one thing I want to mention, the picture that is that is here with these, this goldenrod flower, this little butterfly is called a snout butterfly. And this one also migrates in South Texas. Um, they just migrate within Texas. And so I think for most people in San Antonio who have been here a while, 
there is a period of time in the fall where there are these little cloud clouds of brown butterflies flying across the road and you drive down the road and you run over like a million of them at a time and there's still like five million of them left uh there's just so many of these little butterflies but they're called snout butterflies and um they they just it just depends too if we get a lot of rain it seems like their migrations are more because there's been a lot more caterpillars so but yeah, migration like is the, end the of code October. word <laughs> yes and so we'll we should if we get a migration of snout butterflies it'll be happening in the next few weeks uh one more question here um someone is asking last week they had two separate congregations of lots of ants on their patio any okay. thoughts as to what they might have been doing two separate congregations of ants on their patio um well there are there are something like Oh gosh, 60 or no, maybe it's 100 species of ants in Bear County alone. And most of those species go about their daily lives without even so much as humans knowing that they're there. But uh, we have carpenter ants, we have acrobat ants, we have, of course, fire ants, we have the sugar ants, we have rover ants. Uh, uh, crazy ants that all seem to like to be around homes. So uh, it's very possible that uh, they they were just trailing. They may have been moving a colony from one place to another. Carpenter ants live in just about every tree in San Antonio that's hollow, and that's a natural thing, and they don't harm the tree. The same for acrobat ants. Um, both of these ants are usually black and red, uh, red red body, black tail, and um, and sometimes they show up in homes as well. But it's very possible that they could have been moving colonies um, from one place to the other. Uh, if you um, want to talk about that particular problem more, you can give me a call at SAWS 233 2374, area code 210. And I'll be glad to visit with you about that uh, offline. So yeah, my first instinct would have been to look and see if there was anything that they were feeding on, right? Something that had been dropped or some kind of you know dead animal that they were carrying away. That's very possible. Most of the ant species in our area eat other insects, uh, and some of them like to eat seeds, or some of them like sweet liquids. So. Uh, if you have a hummingbird feeder on your patio, for instance, and sugar water drips down on the ground, that could attract ants too. So there's a lot of possibilities there for sure. Well, great. Any last questions? Any anyone? Otherwise, I think we've had a lot of great information here. Um, yeah. And again, um, we've got this code word here that you're going to need to enter in the reward survey after this. I think Nathan has it set up. So when the presentation ends, there'll be a link there that you can follow um, with just a few questions about the program today and you'll enter that in. Um, if you are not a member of our rewards um, program yet, please go ahead and join. You can go to our website, gardenstylesa.com slash rewards and you can sign up there. Um, that's again for SAWS Water customers. And yeah, let's see if we had any last questions. I think we're good. Nathan, thank you so much. Lots of wonderful information here. Like you said, this is gonna be, um, we've been recording this and we'll get it up on the website in just a few days. Yep, and uh, thank you for being my co-pilot, Sasha. You have helped us navigate this migration topic. Uh, and get us in the right direction. So thanks for that. And uh, thanks everyone for, for joining us today. Uh, we have we have talked about mo migrating monarchs and and uh, orb weaver spiders and, and ladybugs and all kinds of fun things and the plants that the butterflies uh, need to have on their migration. So thanks again, and we'll hope you'll come back and join us for another Noontime Saws Conservation Webinar. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone.